Good morning. Today's video is going to be regarding a video I was watching. Uh, the video on YouTube is called Afro Dominicans Denying Their uh, Blackness. And um, my watching the video, the woman who was talking in the video, uh, I thought um, it was very courageous of her to uh, share her experiences. And uh, I think it was educational to some aspect to teach what, you know, mindsets, what people are being taught about themselves and how people perceive other groups in the United States. So in that aspect, I appreciated what she had to say. Some of the things were a little embarrassing, but um, the things that she was saying are things that she was told or heard. And um, listening to the video, um, I it, it had me think about my own past. I am someone from the uh, whose ancestry is from the Caribbean. But I was born and raised here in New York City, and uh, I do come from a diverse uh, racial background. And um, it, it was uh, problematic living here with uh, having that uh, uh, background. But at this point in my life, um, I. I learned to accept myself and to appreciate my uh, uh, blackness or Africanness, and uh, it, it, it's it's a growing process. But I appreciate who I am, and um, and I will explain to you in this video um, how I came to this point to accept myself. Um, but um, so that's just a really a preface. Uh, to what I want to talk about, you know, and the, uh, the woman in the video, she talked about certain events, um, things that she was told, and I'm going to mention, let's say, about five incidences that happened in my life that um, made me become very angry and uh, bitter, and um, I, I felt like a, a root of hateness and biasness was starting to develop in me. And uh, so again, I, I say that what, what I have to say is not to promote hate, but to share what my experiences were and how I overcame them. Okay, because uh, what happened to me could happen to any individual. You know, we're all human beings and we all have feelings. Okay, with regard to uh, race, uh, race relations between uh, blacks from uh, North America and blacks or mixed race blacks from uh, Latin America in the Caribbean as such. Um, my my first experience with uh, uh, someone from the, um, she was from Puerto Rico. Uh, she was actually dating my brother. I have a twin brother. And uh, um, I didn't know much. This This was over over 30 years ago, it could have been maybe 34 years ago, and uh, I did I really didn't know much about um, ethnic groups or racial groups. I knew there were white people, black people, but outside outside of that, I really didn't know much about uh, people or, or my history at all. I did not know my history, where I came from. I just knew that I live in New York, you know, and that's it. I went through the public school system here. And that was it. So uh, my my brother was uh, dating a woman from um, I think she was actually born in Puerto Rico, but she's living in, in New York. And um, I liked her. She seemed like a nice person. She was a little older than us, and uh, so I kind of saw her as a big sister type. And one day she had called to talk to my brother, and I had picked up the you know answered the phone since my brother was. Uh, uh, in another location in the house, so um, I, I said hello, and we just started talking a little bit, and then she started to <clears throat> to insult me and started talking about uh, uh, um, the ethnic group that she thought I belonged to. She thought I was Haitian, or well, family was Haitian, um, but we're not Haitian. <clears throat> My apology. Um, and uh, I took offense, and uh, I, I wound up uh, hanging hanging the phone on her. And she was really 
I, I never had that experience of, you know, that happening, happened to me. So I had gone downstairs and told my brother what happened, you know. Um, it, it turned out that, that she had a habit of putting my brother down. And uh, my brother eventually uh, did leave her. But that was like the first thing, you know, that someone was making an issue about uh, my ethnicity or race. And, um, you know, because especially that I had uh, looked up to this person. And um, then maybe like, you know, four years after that incident, there was, um, just look at my notes there, um, there, there was, uh, oh, I had friends from junior high school and high school. And uh, they also was um, from the uh, they were Puerto Rican ancestry, but they were born here in New York like myself. And uh, uh, we used to visit each other's homes. But I, I noticed back then I was um, like, uh, when, when I came to the door, I rent the bell, you would open the door. <laughs> And I like, kept on ringing, and I think, you know, eventually they, they might have opened or something, but um, I thought it was odd. And, like, um, you know, once I sort of imagine going in the house, we, we'll go, me and uh, my brother were going to visit them, and we see them coming in the door. They were shopping or something, you know, coming home from shopping, and we just wanted to say hello. So uh, uh, by the time we reached the door, you know, we rang the bell, and it refused to open. You know, they were light skinned Puerto Ricans, and um, I just thought it was very odd. But um, one of their da daughters that I was friends with, uh, she she had um, we had gone out once. We were invited to go to a club uh, with her younger sister, and uh, our youngest sister introduces uh, my friend to this guy. The guy. Um, was a white German, and uh, he was born in Germany, uh, but he came to the U.S., I think he might have been five years old, something like that, and um, with, well, they, they eventually, uh, they got engaged, but like one time when I was visiting her and he was there, he would say like pejorative things, uh, excuse me, pejorative things about being Puerto Rican. And um, she, she just, you know, don't say anything. And I felt uncomfortable being there because I'm, I'm saying to myself, if he feels that way about Puerto Rican, just imagine me. <laughs> so um, he had left the room for a moment. I said, you know, to my friend, hey, um, you know, how can you say things like that? Oh, don't worry. She says, oh, don't worry about that. He, he's just ignorant, and uh, he only has a seventh grade education. And I'm thinking, man, you know, you could do better than that. <laughs> but she's a, she's a nice girl, and, um, you know, she has some college uh, under her. So why even have somebody like that, you know, especially saying those comments? And, um, you know, her, her prior boyfriend, she was engaged to, she uh, leaves him, you know, broke the engagement because um, he was verbally violent towards her. And uh, she said she just couldn't take it one day. She looked in the mirror one day and saw how she looked. She said, you know, I'm going to leave this relationship. And, you know, she, she canceled the engagement. So I was confused. Hey, why is she sticking around with this guy? But this girl, she does marry him and even before she mar she marries him I notice our relationship was changing um, at least to go out a lot and then um, when she had gotten engaged she you know was talking about the wedding and I, I thought I was her uh, closest friend I mean she had other friends too but um, she um, she would talk about the wedding and when I offered to help her you know, with the shopping and everything. She says, oh, that's okay. Um, my um, my in-laws are going to help me and uh, go on. And then she's making arrangements for the reception. And um, she, you know, the same thing, you know, they're helping out. And when she was, you know, I think 
shopping for a wedding dress. She said, oh, we're going uh, out with um, my in-laws, my, my, um, my, her, her boyfriend, her fiance's um, cousins. Uh, she had like four female cousins. And they were going to be uh, in the wedding. And uh, help her, and also help her uh, shopping, getting the uh, wedding dress. Now, I have to add this, that she never met any of his relatives uh, or his cousins. Um, and I always assume when a girl, you know, is getting married and shopping, that her girlfriends will be helping her get the wedding dress, making arrangements. And she has no one. She didn't invite, you know, have, oh, this is my little dog here. If you want to know what that thing is, move on my lap. But, um, you know, she she didn't even have her uh, Hispanic friends, um, you know, involvement in the wedding. And um, she just had these four ladies that she never met, you know, uh, bring them down to help her shop. And I thought it was so odd. I, so I just, I just know I felt uncomfortable. And so I approached her in private. I said, say, you know, um, you know, I, I did offer to help you with the wedding. And, um, you know, uh, I'm not in the wedding. And I'm just curious. I say, I say um, am I not in the wedding because I'm black? And she says, oh, no, no. Uh, we just want to keep it family. You know, we decided we, we just want family members in the wedding. But this person only has one person in her family. She only has one sister and then her parents. And um, so, you know, it just didn't make sense to me, you know, uh, why she didn't even have her other friends. You know, she didn't want me, but, you know, she has other friends from uh, Puerto Rico that she couldn't invite, you know, to be in the wedding. But it was just exclusively her sister and all her maid of honors were people from uh, the guy side of the family. But I, I'm glad I approached her because it was on my heart and um, she gave me the, the response she gave me. And uh, I just knew from that point that um, I probably won't be seeing her anymore, especially after her wedding. But I was invited to the wedding at least. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, when she came back from the honeymoon, um, we, we talked. And everything seemed okay, but um, she then changes her number. And um, I try to call her parents, her parents wouldn't answer the phone as usual. <laughs> and then, so I called her in-laws, because uh, when I was invited to her uh, her shower, and, um, and you know, I, I was on good terms with them, and they gave me her number. So I, I called, and then, then she changed her number again. <laughs> So I said, you know, um, I said, you know, let me just, um, I'm not going to call her. I, I feel any relationship should be a two-way. And I, I didn't want it to be a one-way because I was doing all the calling. So I, I didn't call her for like a year. And um, so I called her after a year. I called her on her job. I was able to get her number from work. And she answers the phone. And when I gave her my name, you know, hey, this is me, and uh, it, you, you think that someone died on the other end. She was like, oh, no, you know, like that, and uh, she's, you know, I'll call you right back. I answered the phone in someone else's uh, cubicle. I'll call you right back. Well, <laughs> I tell you this, that was in 1985, and it's 2014, so it's been a while, and I realized at that point, I said, you know, you know, for, for someone to just uh, a, a, abandon their friends and just want to keep something exclusively white, you know, I, I don't need that. It, I, I was just very surprised and I was very hurt, you know. And um, I, I, I didn't know that she was like that. But um, it's just something I sensed from when we started to uh, date and everything that uh, I, I wasn't going to, you know, she wasn't going to associate with me uh, anymore. And uh, so that was a, another incident. And then one day, like, um, I also used to, um, I used to live in the, um, in the state of Hawaii on Maui. And um, one day, um, 
we, we had a sales rep. Uh, this person, um, I, I never met her until the, the incident, but we had to phone each other. And um, I, I, uh, she seemed like a real pleasant person over the phone, very bubbly. She was the top salesperson in the company, and she was to train the newcomers like myself. So uh, one day when I was coming into work, I, I had like the second shift, and uh, she was with a client. And um, as I'm walking in, she looks at me, and this is the first time I'm seeing her. I don't even know what the person looks like, but uh, I but I knew it had to be her since um, she, it was her shift that I, that I was to work with. And she had said to me, "Oh, um, I I, uh, I I don't like you because uh, of your color, and you're the same color as my sister." She says. And this, and she's saying this in front of a, a client. The client was a, a white woman. I think she was from the mainland. And I'm just like looking at her. I like, said, like you know, what's with her? I'm, I'm saying to myself. And um, she was very negative towards me, very, very hostile. She didn't want me to make any money in the company and um, just very hostile. And even though in the company there are other people of color, but they were not what they were not black. They um, were, you know, people from Asia, uh, the Philippines, and they, they come in all different shades. But um, she, you know, some of them were darker than me. But um, she, she, you know, didn't mistreat them, but she mistreated me. And um, her background, I almost forgot her background. She is, um, she's a very light skin. Um, um, she, she looks uh, like she's from Puerto Rico. Her father is of Puerto Rican ancestry, and her, her mother is Hawaiian. Even, even her mother is darker than me, and some of her children are darker than me. But, uh, and she loves her mom and her children. So it's not a complexion thing. It's a race thing. She knew that I was um, uh, African American, and so anyone... Uh, of the black race, she didn't like, and uh, I guess she didn't want she didn't want to be reminded of her of uh, black ancestry, um, being from Puerto Rico. So um, it, it was it was just very unsettling, and uh, I I was I, I felt forced to uh, to be transferred out of there, uh, but she they eventually uh, then made her my um, manager, and. I, I just knew I wasn't going to make any money in the company. She just had it in for me. And um, so that's what happened with that incident, you know. But everything's like building up. And um, um, so the another incident, um, I, was in, I used to go to uh, cosmetology school. I was learning how to do hair. And this particular woman, um, she... Uh, her mother's from the, the Dominican Republic, and her father was from. He, uh, she said that he was um, uh, Dutch, uh, a white Dutch person, and uh, she was actually born in uh, Curacao. And uh, in school, um, she, um, I thought we were friends, and one day I invited her. Uh, to my to my home. I used to live on 149th Street in Manhattan, and in that neighborhood, most of the people are of Dominican uh, descent. And, um, and she's of just across the water, uh, I think in Wee Hawkins, and yeah, in Wee Hawkins. And so it's just across the water, and um, I, and I was surprised at her response when I invited her. She said um, to me. Oh, uh, I can't go to your house because I'm a white girl, just like that. And so I can't come over there. And I actually thought she was joking because uh, she looks like a, you know, a, a Dominican girl. Um, she has full lips. Um, she she was a light complexion woman, but she does not look like a European. She looks like a girl from the Caribbean like myself, but just a fair complexion. She... Uh, bleach her hair, 
almost a white color. Sorry, my, my computer almost went off. <laughs> so if it went dark, that's what happened. Like I had to restart my computer there. Um, so the, the girl um, would, had bleached hair, almost uh, bleached white. She normally has like black hair. And um, so it, it was just something that, that here she's a beautiful girl. And she she's, you know, bleaching her hair this color to try to um, um, make herself appear even more Caucasian looking. But she just looked like a Dominican girl with bleached uh, white hair. And um, we, we uh, I, I did not continue that friendship. She never came to my place. And um, I, I didn't pursue the relationship after that. And... Uh, but it's like, wow, what, what's what's going on here, you know? And um, these, uh, I, I also met these uh, two men from the Dominican Republic. Uh, one was black in color, and the other one was my complexion. And um, the gentleman who who um, was black in color, he had said to me before, um, he was riding me on his bike. And uh, he was dropping me off someplace, and um, he says, "Oh, you know, uh, people um, from where I'm from, the Dominican Republic, you know, they don't they don't call me black. I uh, they call people my color Indian." <laughs> and uh, I wonder why is he sharing this with me? You know, I'm, I'm from the Caribbean. I'm a woman of color. Why why do you need to even say what how people would categorize you? You're here in the states, you know. Uh, and, and I thought it was an okay guy. I, I wasn't judging him. And um, and then I had this taxi driver from the Dominican Republic who was my complexion. And um, he's, he's riding me to uh, my destination. And he's like staring at my skin and then looking at his. And then he says nervously, well, in, you know, in my country, you know, they call me Indian and not black. <laughs> And I'm just looking at him, and I wonder why these people say these feel that they have to say these things to try to make themselves seem better or or more important. Because what is it actually saying about me? Are they, you know, are they saying that I'm not a good person? <laughs> so that's another incident. And then <clears throat> the the um, Matt's incident I want to talk about is um, an incident that happened to my job. Um, I also did security here in New York City, security work. And um, at this job site, there was a, a woman from uh, Puerto Rican ancestry, fair complexion, and um, uh, I thought she was an okay person until uh, she said something that really disturbed me. And I think with the with the... The background of the the things that I shared with you uh, made me more sensitive because it was coming from her. Uh, I uh, had to be relieved of my pulse. You know, after the end of a shift, you have to you know be ne the next person uh, relieves you of your post. And it was a uh, a, a gentleman, and uh, he's he's Hispanic. I don't know whether he's from Puerto Rico or not, or one of the, uh, I'm not sure. But he was a nice guy. Um, we were both students, and um, um, when he came, came in, I said hello, whatever, and, and you know, it was maybe a two-minute conversation because I had a race to go to school right after that. I, I worked graveyard shift, and so when it was eight o'clock in the morning, I, you know, had to race to school because my first class was at uh, nine, you know, just some minutes before ten a.m. So I had a race because I had to get change and eat and all that. So. Um, this this particular woman, um, she she had said um, after my uh, saying hello to him, she says, "Oh, you know, you should, you know, you can't go out with him, you can't date him because you know." I mean, she's just rambling on, and I'm thinking, "What is she talking about?" I I mean, he's just a fellow coworker, and. Um, and telling him what happened during the shift, and then I have to, you know, race to go to school, and, you know, well, what is this? I felt judged. That That's how I felt. I felt judged by her. 
and I felt well. The guy was a uh, lighter complexion than me, and I and I thought she didn't like that my being brown skin and talking to this person. So I I I, I took offense, but I didn't say anything to her. And then um, shortly, you know, some days after that, she starts flirting with the client, uh, the client's uh, co-worker, um, I mean, employee there. And the, the, the employee, um, he was uh, half Puerto Rican and half Italian. And um, but she's openly flirting with him and then talking to me about how she likes the guy and this and that. And I felt uncomfortable. And I was actually angry. Because I felt like, hey, you just telling me I cannot, I shouldn't do this or that, and I wasn't doing what she was saying, but yet she's openly, you know, bragging about what she's doing. So I had resentment in me, because um, I felt that she was judging me, and I felt that she was saying indirectly that I wasn't as good. And so an incident happened uh, shortly, so a few days after that. She was to, um, I was to relieve her of her post, but she had left before I arrived. At this time, this was shortly after, um, you know, the World Trade Center, you know, 9-11 incident. And so we were on cold orange at the time, you know, at, at that particular job site. And uh, there was also a lot of theft going on. And so um, her leaving early from her post, puts me at odds uh, because of this theft that was going on and um, you know the, if, if something bad happened in between that window period of time I could I would be blamed and I didn't want that and I also sensed that they were going to try to make her my my uh, manager and I didn't feel comfortable with that because I didn't feel that she really liked me so uh, to protect myself and my reputation at the company, uh, or at least I felt to protect my job, that um, I reported that my, I was not relieved of my post, um, and it, it left a gap, you know, in security. And um, she also was friends with, with management as well, but I wasn't. So she, she nothing happened to her. She was able to keep her job, um, but it, it uh, she resented me for it, and um, so after that incident, uh, she was more hostile in her behavior towards me, and she would tell, um, she had told this uh, new person in security, who also was of Puerto Rican ancestry, he was a fair complexion uh, guy, very nice, he was a nice fellow though. Um, and um, she whispered to him, and I'm right there, a couple of feet away from them, and I hear her telling the guy, oh, um, you shouldn't carry the keys, you know, have her carry it for you, Don't, you shouldn't have to carry that, let her carry it. And I took that as, hey, I'm not his slave. <laughs> That's how I took it as. And it was other little things. And um, be before my um, leaving for the day, um, uh, she was in the, the main office, and um, oh, I have to add that. Oh, I did say there was a lot of theft going on. There was no theft on the floor that I had to patrol, and um, but all the theft happened on, during her um, her watch and on her floor. And so when I was waiting to be relieved of my post, we had to go to the main main center um, to wait for our, our replacement to come. She was there as well, and she's like telling me what 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 to do, this and that, and I I I was just so fed up with her. I thought she was just acting very arrogant and uh, trying to show she was superior over me, and I I lost it. I think with all the things that had happened to me that I explained early in this video, and then her uh, attitude, I lost it. I. I actually yelled at her. I, I raised my, I, I shouted at her from my belly and it just came out and uh, I, I told her what I told her and uh, someone else had walked in <laughs> as I was screaming at her and calling her out. Um, but 
she she wrote me up for it um and uh, we we had to have a meeting and um uh i i explained to her to the management why i yelled at her and why i said my comment but um i don't feel comfortable uh, i i guess i'm still a little embarrassed about what i said but i in, in essence what i said was i'm tired of you know people from her uh, her background, I feel that they're, that they're attacking me and I want to stop. I'm fed up. That's basically, at least that's the meaning, you know, what I wanted to com to tell her. I actually felt attacked by her and I, I it was only, only my way to protect myself. And um, I think I felt a little embarrassed after the incident and the girl also seemed very remorseful after it. She she actually transferred out of the um, the job site after the incident, and um, but why why I share this with you? Um, I know it could get a little long winded what I'm saying, but I share this with you in in in, in steps and in, in, of intensity because you know sometimes people respond, and my response to her um, was very volatile, but it was actually, it was the result of a cumulative um, um, behavior that was a get, done against me. And I thought that it was a bias incident or jealousy, whatever, what you call it. And so sometimes people react in certain ways, not because of just one incident. It's a buildup or it's a lifetime of, of buildup. And it comes out the way uh, it, it could come out. And so, my sharing you with these stories is really just to say, you know, you know, why do we act this way? Why, why do people? I mean, anyone can act the ways that uh, these people have acted. You, you could be of any race, ethnicity, but in this case, these were from people from um, the uh, Spanish-speaking islands in the Caribbean. But I ask myself, why are they acting this way? Why a need to um, separate yourself from um, non-Spanish speaking uh, blacks? Why um, why exclusion from certain social events? And I've heard of other people, uh, blacks who uh, would, were um, shunned from uh, invitations to weddings, and you know, we, we, and here we can socialize with each other, we can go to parties, you know, events, but then when certain things like marriage or you get a certain type of job, you know, it's like they, they can't, um, they don't want to be around you. So I realized that this is a history of, of hatred. It's about self-hatred. And as the woman in the video that I mentioned about Afro-Dominicans denying their blackness, that, the, that it's a component of that. These people didn't want to be reminded of their black heritage, like the woman from Hawaii. That um, she didn't want to be reminded that she came from her father's people came from the islands, and uh, and it wasn't so much about skin color, but about racial identity. And um, uh, because in Hawaii, people come of all different complexions, very dark to very light. And uh, how how are we going to correct this? So this is this is how I think the problem of um, hatred could be um, how we can become more enlightened, and with enlightenment comes liberation. For me, the turnaround about um, accepting myself, who I am, um, came about well, it, well um, about a year ago, uh, last February. I was uh, turning the radio station to, um, uh, I forget, uh, WBLI, I think it's called. And um, in February is Black History Month. And I like talk radio. So when I turned it on and I found the station, they were talking. So I said, let me listen to this. What did with the, the station? They, um, they, they, they had a lot of... Um, you know, talks about um, black history, uh, 
And I thought it was fascinating. They, they mentioned about people and places and things that I've never heard about. It. And uh, so I would, you know, have a computer. And so I would um, type in the name, you know, Google, you know, do a Google search on the name or the event that they talked about in, in history. And I, would, I started to educate myself about these people. And I found it fascinating. It really started to open up my eyes. And I think people from Latin America um, should, should um, you know, educate themselves about these events, about um, black heritage, you know, the, the events that happen in the Americas against black people. They will have a whole different perspective about themselves and about the whites that they might try to emulate. When you know your history and when you start to become informed about what happened to you in the Americas, you, you, you can't walk around the same way. You will not hate yourself uh, the, to, this, to the extent that you do. You will really start to have an appreciation of yourself. Um, you know, you, you know, we we have, um, you know, grandmothers, and so, some of these people that I mentioned, they would like hide their grandmothers. That the mothers were, were darker complexion, and they would like hide them, and they didn't want the the you know their their white friends seeing them. And I said, you know that you know, you gotta you you gotta love your grandmas. You know, <laughs> we got black grandmothers. Um, and we shouldn't hide them. And um, the, to learn about our, our black history, you know, the more you learn about what what some white uh, men have done to our, our grandmothers, you know, you, you, you're not going to think the same. That woman went through a lot. And she did the best she could to, to raise you and to, to teach you what, she, what you know. And... To deny your heritage is like slapping your grandmother in the face, and I'm sure you love your grandmothers. You know, we have to honor our ancestors. You know what they went through for them to to see that. You know how you're treating other people who, you know, were in the same boat. You know, um, people from the Caribbean. You know, we're, we're all related. Uh, whatever, wherever you know, if we're you know, brought to Puerto Rico or, or Haiti or Florida or Georgia, you know, that those slave boats, they didn't discriminate. They just took anybody from Africa that they could, could get. You can have a, one brother goes to Florida, uh, an auntie went to Cuba, uh, 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 a sister went to Brazil, you know, grandma, they sent her to uh, Georgia, you know, we're all related, and we have to come together as a people. The language languages that we speak is is the result of the people who persecuted us, who enslaved us, and so the languages that we speak are European languages. They're not African languages. It's not all a real language, and we have to start appreciating where we come from, and. Um, you don't see whites walking around feeling ashamed of themselves and disliking their skin color. They, a lot of them, they they know nothing about the history of, of slavery. But even though they don't know the history of slavery, many of them, but they're reaping the benefits of what slavery provides for them now. And that's what they want to maintain. And so they go to all these extremes to keep us from moving into certain areas. Um, the school systems, they aren't educating the children. Uh, but if you go to a, a white school district, they, you know, they, they have a very good uh, learning system. But when you come to areas where you have a lot of blacks or Hispanic blacks or um, Caribbean, that the quality of the education starts to go down. We're just as intelligent as any group on this planet. And in fact, the whites that um, the, the whites get the, their true knowledge from Africa, 
um, you, you find a lot of whites go to Africa, go to Asia, go to parts of the Americas, and go to these indigenous people and learn about their medicines, they learn about um, textiles, they learn about um, um, working with metals, you know, um, craftsmanship. Um, I mean, even look at the pyramids. You know, th these were African people with a um, high, high level of skills. And so these Europeans go to these places and then they acquire the knowledge and then they write books and make you think that that knowledge came from them and then they want to try to block you from learning and so they can dominate over you. So I say, hey, they should be ashamed of what they do. When they walk down the street, they should be ashamed what they did to your grandmother or your grandpa, you know, and I say that figuratively. Of course, it's not your grandmother, grandfather. I'm talking about um, in, in the past, uh, um, past years when um, slavery and post-slavery, you know, newly emancipated slaves, what they went through. You know, when you when you see things like that, you know, and you know the history, you know, you're going to say, hey, why should I be ashamed? You're going to start walking with your head up high in self-respect, you know, and that's what that's that's what you need. You need to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I have value. And it was just the distortion of, of history and the perversion of what they've done to you that is making you ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of yourself. Uh, you look, you know, you you look at history. Initially, I felt uncomfortable doing the search over the internet with regard to um, um, slavery and, and like subjects. Uh, I felt embarrassed, but I forced myself to look at it. But once I started looking at it, I, I felt the empowerment of it, you know. I even used to have bad dreams as a young girl. Um, I was a teenager, and I used to have these recurrent dreams about being chased by uh, dark-skinned black men. And I was filled with fear in these dreams. And then one day in this dream, I, I, I said, you know, I'm fed up with running. And I said, I'm going to face them. So I stopped running in the dream. I turned around, and I looked at him, and what I saw shocked me. And it, it opened up my eyes, and it was a, 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 a start of, of true liberation, of, of racial liberation. What I saw in front of me was a little black boy, and he had tears in his eyes, and he was whimpering like like that. And um, I, I just felt sorry for him, and um, that was the last of that of a, of dreaming things like that. What was happening was that this young boy, this young black boy, was hurting emotionally, and he he was he. Want, he wanted uh, someone to love them. So it's really interesting how the dynamics were right? that these, when the mission looked like a man, you know, turned out to be a little boy. A uh, little, little, looked like a little seven year old. But all in my mind, it was building it up. It was building up. And I, I was getting into such a fear. I was afraid of my, my, I was afraid of blacks. I was afraid of myself. And but that dream uh, was a start of my process of being uh, liberated. You know, seeing that it was just a little child hurting and in one comfort. You know, and um, so it was it was a it, it was a, 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 a many process thing for me. But the main thing is that you have to face your fears. And when you know, just as in that dream, I faced my fear and. To find that the problem was not me, the problem was the hurt in that person. I think a lot of uh, blacks in America, blacks in the Caribbean, whether uh, you're Spanish speaking, French, uh, or whether you come from Brazil and you speak Portuguese, we are hurting people. We are people who were, were lied to. And um, 
we're bombarded by uh, by visual and audio or messages and constantly telling us that we're not important and to have white characteristics is uh, desirable and I say you know we have to stop that we have to say you know we we are a people of value uh, we're, we're indigenous to the planet and so it's ours this is our land and we have to respect ourselves our bodies we have to love our children we have to stop uh, calling each other bad names regarding our complexion or our hair texture God made us and because God made us God also loves us and he wants the best from us let's start uh, loving ourselves and loving our neighbors from the heart, you know. And some Hispanics might might say to themselves, "Well, I don't want to associate with black, people, you know, American blacks, and and our numbers are now are uh, are more than uh, non-Hispanic blacks." And you might think that's a plus. And the the the, the whites, uh, some whites want um, Hispanics and blacks. To fight each other, and uh, but you gotta see through the enemy. The, the 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 white in general is not your enemy, and they know your history as well. Even though you may have a fairer complexion and longer hair, yet they still know that you're not white, and that yes, maybe their goal is to use you to get rid of American blacks. But you know, just like with Adolf Hitler. How Adolf Hitler, uh, the uh, German Chancellor, of, uh, you know, German Chancellor during World War II, he, how he got into power, he got he he had like a like a, a, a military force called the Brown Shirts. These were the the, the thugs of of his organization, and uh, he used this as a leverage to to get his immediate enemies, and then. Um, when the Nazi regime really came into power, that you know what we know of it today, he uh, had another subgroup called the SS um, in his organization, and those were the elites of his organization. These were people who were, you know, doctors, you know, before the war and everything. They they were the you know the, the pretty boys, so to speak. But what what they did though, what the regime did. That the uh, SS killed off the brown shirts, the, the so-called thugs of the organization. These were the less educated, and so here. So my point with this is that you may think that you, you that you're getting that you're being approved by uh, by the, the the white man, but the white man is using you just like Hitler used the brown shirts, and then once you're Uses complete the SS or some other. In this in this case, it would be someone else, and then they're gonna kill you off. So I'm saying you don't want to be end up like the brown shirts. <laughs> you want to live. So I said, you know, embrace your black heritage or your or Native American heritage, and let us come together as people of color. Because again, we have a, a common heritage, and we're indigenous of the planet, and so let's come together and let us heal. Let's heal one another, so that we can move forward. Because that's what life is about: moving forward and loving each other. So you you know you have to make a choice in life. You could uh, reap the illusion of of inclusion now. Or face death uh, in the future. So you know, as the Bible says, choose life over death. So you make your choice, and let us love one another. And again, my speaking this video is not to promote hate. It is to promote understanding, to educate oneself, so that we do not uh, destroy ourselves. So I say peace to you all, and let me know what your comments are, uh, because again, this life is a life of of growing and learning, okay? Because I don't know all the answers. 
So take care, you two. Bye-bye.